You're watching the New Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. Well, 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 I am so excited about our guest today, Adrian Cockroft. And Adrian is now a tech advisor. He's in semi retirement of sorts. Adrian has a career that I've always found so interesting. I think a lot of people know Adrian from his days, you know, talking about Netflix and what they did there, what he did there as a cloud architect, but he's done so much more. And he spent a long time at uh, Amazon Web Services. He was a technology fellow at, at Battery Ventures. And it's just one of the friendliest, nicest people you'll you'll meet. And so I won't try to like, I won't overdo it, Adrian, but uh, it's great to have you here. Yeah, well, thanks. And it's been great. We used to hang out a little bit back when I was with, with Battery Ventures. We did a few yeah. recordings then. Uh, and then I joined Amazon and the big Amazon PR machine got in the way and wouldn't let me <laughs> talk to you about interesting things. So one of the things now, about a year ago, I retired out of Amazon and like I said, I'm doing consulting advisory things kind of when I feel it, doing a few, feel like it and doing a few conferences when they're in interesting places and um, generally enjoying myself. I had a 40 year long career and decided that was enough of working for big companies and I was just happy to mess around and do things I think are interesting now. Well, excellent. And we were chatting the other day and we were thinking about topics we could discuss. And the topic of retraining came up. And I know you have an interest in generative AI and as we all do. And and I th- thought, you know, I don't really know much about generative AI overall. I don't think many of us do. I think it's still very much DIY. And that's really the impression I get about retraining. And so I went over to ChatGPT, Adrian, just to kind of get my senses straight on what retraining is. I thought, if there's any authoritative source on uh, retraining it, I would expect it might be ChatGPT and the people who actually put together these models. And they describe it as uh, retraining is generative AI. In generative AI, refers to the process of updating or fine-tuning a pre-trained machine learning model using new data. And this is done really then to adapt to changing conditions, you know, improve his performance, you know, or any specific tasks, you know, incorporating new information. And this is something I know that you're really interested in. I'm curious about, you know, what your view of retraining is. Why do you find it interesting? And, you know, and what you see of it, of c- coming from it. I also then will, I ask some questions about the actual integrations itself, because that's where I think our audience is interested. Like, how do I use this in my business? Like, how do I, how do I use this? You know, how do I do the data collection? How do I do all the, uh, you know, the other types of things? And it seems to be, there's a lot there between the processing, the data storage, the database types, you know, the, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot there. So we have some ground to cover. Sure. Yeah. And I wouldn't describe myself as an expert either, but I've no. been trying to figure out and I'm sort of seeing some patterns. And generally, you know, in my career, one of the things I've done is kind of tried to stay at the leading edge and figure out complicated things and try and digest them down into maybe something that's a bit more uh, easy to consume. So I think probably the best place to start is for the last quite a few years, we've kind of got used to AI systems that you could train you know, is the sort of typical, is this a cat or a dog or, you know, what letter is this in the alphabet, that kind of stuff. And so there was training and inference. You train your um, your personal assistant to understand speech, and then you'd run an inference to say, what did somebody just say? And training was getting increasingly, you know, con- con- if you've got a big deployment, you actually spend more time doing inference than training. And if you're still in the early days, you tend to spend more time doing training, trying to get the product right mm. before you hit scale. So there's kind of, um, if you look at the workloads, there are very specific and different architectures for this. Even to the extent that AWS has two custom instance types, one's called Inferentia and one's called Trainium, right? Is that pretty clearly gives you a good clue yeah. for what they're for, right? Yeah. Um, and they've developed those over the years. And some of the differences there is when you're training, 
you're you're continually refining the model and it's more sensitive to numeric overflow and things like that. So you tend to use more precision in the mathematics, you use full floating point math. But when you're doing inference, it actually doesn't matter quite so much. And they're able to tune the models down to use much lower precision uh, math because it's kind of a fuzzy match, right? And and so there are some, you tend to see uh, a larger number of um, sort of lower precision mathematics going on. And that gives you, if you have the precision of the math, you can go twice as much, right? So if you look at, most people have heard of 64-bit, 32-bit floating point, but now there's 16-bit and 8-bit, right? And you can, if you're doing 16-bit, you can do twice as much as you can, you know, you can go twice as fast. So there's some interesting things happening there with the two workloads. And that that's kind of where we've been for a while. And you see people using whatever, TensorFlow and PyTorch and things like that over the years. What happened with generative AI is that the models got much bigger. It's a hundred you know, gigabyte, you know, billions to up to now kind of trillions level, you know, parameters models, and it takes a long time to train them. But what you're doing when you build these models is something that's that gives you a new step in between. So you can take a model that was trained, and the way my sort of mental image for this is, you know. Uh, I want to have a high school intern. Like it takes you, whatever, 16 years to train and to, to build a high school intern, a human one, right? But then you can train them to do something in a week and get them to do that, right? You're, the, so the retraining is you've taken some level of intelligence, which is, you know, depending on what you're asking to do it, it's it's sort of reasonably clever, but but a little bit dumb around the edges, right? A little bit immature, immature and occasionally it, it just gets confused. So you've got something like that. And then what's been happening with the sort of you know GPT-3, GPT-4, and as that goes through, it's like we've gone from a high school intern to a college intern. It's just better. It knows a bit more, but it's still, and it can be trained to do new things. And eventually you get something. In some areas, maybe the training is as good as just you know a regular, somebody with a bunch of experience. And eventually in some areas, maybe better than humans are, mm. right? But it's very, it's very piecemeal. Like there's certain tasks that really fit and it's re very good at and there's other things that it just you know will flail at and you can always find something in these um you, know, you can always find chat gpt examples that it just did something stupid right but what's I, interesting just to just write what you said about having that you know that almost that aid like just having you know an aid that's maybe college level in you know intelligence is actually quite helpful and actually can be quite a help in like increasing increasing you know your 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 time to understanding yeah it's more that what kind of tasks can you give it yeah right um i mean the experience is that you know most of us have played around with chat gpt and asked it questions and and i used it recently because i wanted to do some coding in a language that i don't use very often and i didn't remember i don't always remember the syntax and everything so i thought i'd just start off asking it to um you know just as some syntax now, how does he, how do you do this bit again it ended up writing most of the code for me and i was quite surprised i was using the r language to do some statistical stuff yeah so, and i'm finding that it works there's a few sweet spots right where if you're trying to do some data analysis and you just want hints on, okay, how should I do this next step? How should I right. visualize something? It's actually become extremely good at that. It felt to me like I had a really experienced um, programmer, you know, experienced in this entire toolkit and all the, you know, that knew all the documentation and, and, and was familiar with the language, just sort of at hand to help me. So that's that's kind of the sweet spot where you're, um, it's currently working really well. And then there are some areas where it will rapidly go off and start inventing GitHub repos right. that don't exist and papers that don't ex research papers that don't exist and things like that. So that's so that's kind of where we are with you know most people have been playing around and have had similar experiences. I'm also interested in you know, I have one of those Teslas with the self-driving thing on it and I use that quite a lot. And again, it's the AI has gradually been getting better and more human-like over time, and occasionally it will lose its mind and get confused. And but most of the time, it's doing a pretty good job. So we're seeing this incremental improvement in, in a number of areas. So going back to this sort of fine-tuning idea, um, 
you've got this conversation and people are actually learning that you can do prompt engineering. Like if you're going to get some programming advice, the first thing you tell it is, I want good programming advice because it, what it's got in its, in its model is all the programs it's seen. And you might say, uh, I, I want you to program like you're an expert programmer in this system, or you know, write me Java code like you're James Gosling or something like that. And maybe it goes and finds code that he wrote or something like that, or there is a sort of a style that's better. So there's these things you can do with prompt engineering where you're basically setting up the conversation to try and bias the, the, the AI into a space where you want it to go. And, and these prompts are getting increasingly sophisticated with plugins and things where you're actually building really quite a lot of information, which is basically loaded into the model before you start using it, that can be quite targeted at a particular domain. Um, and then sort of between that and the full training, there's this sort of idea of fine tuning the model where maybe um, it's too big to put in a prompt. For example, I've heard of people sort of signing up with OpenAI for it with an account as, at a corporate level. But the first thing they do is they feed all of their corporate information into it. So you do this sort of fine tuning training. So here's, here's all of our, uh, all our wiki pages, say all your Confluence pages or your SharePoint for the entire company. Here's the corporate oh. website. Here's all the public information about the company. And then here's the internal private information that we have. And it sort of sets up so that the, the AI model now understands your terminology, your domain, how to do things at your company, your internal processes, all, the, all that documentation. And you're effectively training the model, you're fine tuning the model to be a somebody that understands your company. And then you go and start building something on top of that, or you're asking it questions or building whatever assistance you want. But it's kind of got this extra level of, of information where you've you've fine tuned it. So that's one kind of fine tuning. Let's, let's talk about And that this is the retraining and this is the retraining that you're talking about. Yeah. You're kind of you're yeah, you're tr you're adding a bunch of extra information, which is enough information you wouldn't want to load it every single time you start a conversation, but you want to fine tune it to be better at doing something. So this in this case, that example what I'm talking about is just adding local context, like for a particular situation, like what does this company do? level of stuff. The other thing you might want to do is actually, if you ask ChatGPT about what's going on in the AI space right now, it's actually out of date, right? It was trained, right. that big training data is from a year or two ago. Yeah. So it, I forget exactly what the current date is, but um, what it means is if you ask it about, you know, what's that latest paper and what's the implications of it, it has no clue because it didn't see it. So the other kind of uh, fine fine tuning or, or retraining is to basically bring it up to date. Let's say you want to do a, a, a traffic um, a system, that, uh, um, transport system. You want to basically be able to give people recommendations on, on, on how to get somewhere, right? You might need to know the weather. So you have to give it today's weather. And now you've got whatever it was going to do, but relative to the weather or even advertising. Sometimes you want to do TV advertising when it's raining. Right, it, it, more people are in TV. This this works doesn't really work in California because it doesn't rain. But in the UK, <laughs> where it's raining a lot of the time, people watch TV when it's raining. When the sun comes out, they go outside, mm. right? And that, so you, it actually makes a big difference uh, if you're targeting somebody. Um, the sort of models you can use, which really matter, and make, there's all kinds of business things that matter. What's the demand that uh, say a uh, uh, an Uber like car rental company is going to have. You've got to kind of look at current information and, and have up to date things. So if you're trying to do intelligent assistance that depends on recent information, again, you've got to do this sort of fine tuning training. You're not going to go to back to the beginning and spend all of the effort required to build the model from the from the beginning, but you're going to keep like adding in this this training, extra training data to it and retraining it. You know, I uh I asked ChatGPT about retraining model. What are some best practices for it? You know, and uh, one of the challenges, I mean, that we've just seen internally is actually you can do the you can do the query on ChatGPT, but then how do you get it into your software and your systems, right? You know, so so you know, it comes down to kind of matters such as how do you keep track of things? Well, that's where Git comes into play, right? You know, what are you know what's the uh, you know what's the what are some of the different ways that you can think about um, uh, version control, 
right? Because you're going to want to be able to um, understand, uh, you know, what what you're looking at and what what's differing from one, you know, from one one version to another. Uh, they talk about m- modular code and stru- structured code, you know, automation using workflows for retraining, like with tools like Make and Airflow or or even Jenkins. You know, yeah, and, you that know. sounds like it's a fairly generic answer. Right. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, but it gives you a sense. I'm trying to get a sense of what what's required for the person listening to this show to mm-hmm. think about when they're actually doing that retraining. Right? What are those? What are those? What are those tasks that they need to be thinking about? Yeah. So the other thing that's happened recently is there's a new kind of database, and if you think about what is in in one of these models, it's got a whole lot of weights, right, which embed the mm-hmm. meanings of the word. So a word or a concept has has a a series of numbers which represent it. Mm-hmm. And when you're trying to understand something, what you're basically doing is sort of a fuzzy match against these numbers. Right? You're not looking for the exact, so you can't search for the exact thing. You're trying to find the thing that's closest, right. right? rather than the thing that's an exact match. Whereas when you query a database, you do a SQL query or whatever, you're saying, what's the exact match? Like I'm looking right. for a customer ID. Here's this customer. Whereas in, a, in an AI system, you might be looking for something much more fuzzy. Like, what what is this phrase? What what do these words mean that you that you've just fed into it, and it's trying to match meaning out of that? So what's come what's come along recently is this idea about a vector database. Because right. what you've got here is a vector. A vector is just an array of numbers, and the the big new player in this space is most is really Pinecone. So it's a new vendor. That's what kind of what OpenAI runs on. The really big models are using things like Pinecone to store the data. But interestingly, just about every other database has suddenly went, oh, we can do that too. So you've got Redis and MongoDB and Postgres, and and I assume all the other, I think Cassandra, pretty much every major database vendor has like rushed out with a, 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 basically a way to store vectors and a way to search them. So you have this ability now in whatever, whatever database you've got, your fine tuning is basically an extra set of vectors. Right? So you, you you do your tuning, you figure it out, you, and you store this extra set of vectors, which are the embedding, the encodings basically of your documents. And you basically, when you do your query, it basically blends that into the main database. So so that's just, you know, as you're looking at developing a tool in this, you may well end up with something where, where it, you're having to store this extra data. And it seems like the kind of, everybody's dashing off to build these things and some places are going to be some vendors are going to have better tools than others but uh, it seems like it's going to be just a general capability of databases is this idea that you can do a kind of a fuzzy match search into the system um, in order to get the data back out i i've heard scholars talk about this are people who are you know actively building these models uh and they talk about generalization i think that's similar to what you're talking about with uh, you know this fuzzy capab- fuzzing capability. Yeah, but what you're really saying is that let's say that example I had of um, the company that loads its entire corporate information, it, it retrains on that, right? So you've got the base trained model, and then you've got a bunch of uh, vectors which are basically encoding everything you had in a certain confluence um, wiki. Or maybe you've got all your Jira tickets in there because you want to be able to think about what's the history of all of your releases or all of your incidents or something like that. So the people are looking at sort of operational technology where where you're continually feeding incidents in and trying to pattern match what to do about it. But those would be stored as as a, a, a just a large pile of numbers. And you have to be able to sort of match in. Does this Jira ticket look like this other Jira ticket? What's the nearest thing that you've seen before? To this issue, and what what happened about it? So you could have a you know if you if you wanted to train this on something like a like a ticketing system, you've got a problem description, and then you've got what you found. What what did you do about that previously? And that way you can do a very fuzzy search. You're not looking searching for the exact problem. You're just looking what is the nearest thing to that problem in terms of the the text that described it in, in the document and other features. So that's kind of the the way to think about this. I think. So for the Software engineers out there, and for the you know who work for organizations that are have you know very complex uh, software stacks, then retraining becomes then just a matter of figuring out how to integrate it, integrate it into those stacks overall, right? Yeah. So you've got to have some process which is going to go and say, I'm going to continually re 
reread my Confluence or re or look at the latest gyro tickets or whatever, and you're continually updating the model. So you've got to build some kind of continuous delivery pipeline around the AI system mm. that's feeding it and updating it so that it stays current. So that's kind of the way that you know, the, the deployment, I think, is going to look. So wh- where do you see this going then? What, what What's interesting to you about it? Is it just the ability to, to take that base knowledge out of LLM and then build upon it? I think... The rate of change here is very high. This is something we haven't seen for many years, maybe decades. Um, and there's pretty good consensus on that. So one of the things that's interesting is that um, things that you, if you read a story about this that was written a few months ago, it may be completely out of date and irrelevant by now. Right? It's, it's This area, whole area is moving so fast that if you if you say, hey, this thing can't be done, Someone will take that as a challenge, and a month or two later, there'll be a paper, and they say, "Yeah, we've done that, right?" And including the amount of energy and 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 compute needed to solve some of these problems, and in needed to do the retraining, is actually coming down really fast. And then the other thing was people saying, "Well, there's these enormous models, and they cost an enormous amount to um, to train." So that means that the people that can afford to train them are going to have a big advantage. And that was that became sort of the orthodoxy for a while, and then Facebook released it, its its own model as open, basically opened it up, and then released the the um, all all of the training data for it as well. But I mean the training results. So basically, you've got a pre-trained open source model, um, and a lot of that just changed the way. Now now everyone can get it and play with it. I think it's, you know, there are a few license restrictions about what you can use it for, but it's it basically meant that instead of it took away some of the key things that um, everyone said, well you you couldn't possibly complete with open, compete with open AI on this. And the same get, getting almost as good results with the with the open source model. And then what happens is that people start iterating around open source, if we, as we've seen in the past, you know, like Linux versus all the different proprietary Unixes or and these kinds of things. The uh, the open source community, if they see value in something, will actually push the development forward really fast. So I think one of the things that's interesting is that this is potentially turning into an open source um, driven model with a lot of people very interested in it. The other thing I think is particularly interesting is that it's um, it's one of these exponential things. People generally overestimate in the short term how, how well something works. So you look at it, it doesn't really do what you want. You get a bit kind of the hype kind of level. But in the long term, you usually underestimate what it can do. So right now, yeah, there's a lot of promise. There's a bunch of things you can do. There's a bunch of things you'd like to do that maybe don't quite work as well as you'd like um, when you actually get into it. But I think in the in the next year or two, we're going to see, um, re- like, if you think about it as the age of the intern that you get to hire when you're you, when you're using a model, in that sense, the age is going to go up, and in more and more areas, it's going to become like a, a senior engineer level of of technical competence. Because the thing is. There's too much documentation to read. Like, who knows how to program every framework in Java? It's it's enormous space, right? It takes forever to become an expert. Who knows every AWS uh, service? I, I don't know them all, right? But the, your chat your chat system can be trained on all that documentation, and then you've got this expert that has read the docs and has read every example out there and all the case studies and can say, oh. What you're trying to do fits this piece of documentation, this case study. Here's the service you should be using. And we're going to have assistants which take a lot of the expertise need out. And what what that means, it just speeds you up. So when I was writing that code I was talking about, I think I was going at least 10 times faster than I've ever built code. In, you know, just just I'm usually staring at the man pages and trying to figure out how to do stuff. And it was just giving me, in, a, in 30 seconds, it gave me a page of code it would have taken me hours to figure out, right? Now, if I if I was a super, if I used that system every single day and coded in it every single day, I'd have no trouble writing that code. But what it means is that you'll be able to build things more quickly. And I think that the, that's the kind of the thing that's most exciting right now. What are the hurdles then? What are the, you know, what are the matters that you have to 
uh, consider, you know, as trade-offs? I think the main one right now is that, you know, there may be bugs in the code it generates. And it can be quite hard to debug if you don't really know the language very well, which is why you're using the assistant. So, you, so right now, you have to be a competent user of the language to be able to, to get in there. Every now and again, it might take you an hour or two to debug something. I mean, you, but you have bugs in your own code, but you probably got there faster. So there's, that's kind of the thing right now. And I think that over the next you know, coming months and years, that's those kind of it's going to have fewer bugs. It can be able to test things. It will just be you know, more reliable. So I think that's typically where the, the main drawback is right now is that when it's good, it's good. And when it gets a bit off target, it's hard to tell. Right? How do you know if it's, they call it hallucinating? How, long, how do you know that it made something up? You have to go and check it. And, but if you're, asking, if you're working in an area that's extremely well documented and well understood and it was well understood a couple of years ago, you're going to find that it works really well. So coding in a mainstream language, using mainstream libraries. I have a chat conversation where I want to go. I'm, I'm going on vacation in Italy. That tell me about all the places in Italy. Like the documentation on on travel information is extremely reliable. Except if I actually start asking about an individual hotel, I might find that hotel doesn't really exist or it's you know, not whatever, right? So there's as you get more specific, um, uh, you you can find yourself off in in a space where it, it's actually just hallucinating something. So I think right now the main thing is to try and understand and how to keep it on that on that nice a well-documented track and how to just figure out when it's becoming a little bit more um, bit more flaky. And there's sort of an art to doing it. It's like just, you know, like driving a car. Can you keep a car on the road, right? That's something you learn and the computers can learn. But every now and again, you, you kind of go, okay, I need to, I, I, I need to, I know that I'm, you know, going down a bumpy road and if it's, you've got to pay a lot more attention to what it's doing. The tools, the APIs, the, the, the integration practices, you know what? What's your what's your perspective right now on all, on those types of things to actually get it to work and getting it a part of the business into the workflow? I think you referred to it early with vector databases, but there's a lot more uh, that is required as well. I I think the area is moving so fast that you have to be open to talking to a lot of startups. Yeah. There's a lot of start a lot of VC investment. There's a lot of startups. If you can think of a problem, there's probably a few startups already trying to solve yeah. it. And right. so it's, some of it is how do you find them and which ones are working out. Um, just a lot of uh, very early stage experimentation. So in some ways, it feels a bit like, like the early days of the web or something like that. There's a whole bunch of brand new stuff, people inventing things, um, and um, and not a lot of you know, not a lot of you know vendors with a lot of track record kind of kind of basis. And and because it's very much at the bleeding edge. I think we're seeing uh, new vend, you know, new people leave their big company and go start something. So there's there's just a huge amount of VC investment and startup activity right now. So plugging into that, I think, is kind of the main thing. And maybe in on your podcast, just going out and getting some of the um, the new guys, you know, some yeah. of the you know some people from some of these new companies on to say, well, what are you doing? What problem are you solving? How does that fit in? And that's going to be. Uh, sort of a useful, useful thing. Cause, yeah, like this is the new stack, right? And um, there yeah. is a new, there is a, there is a new stack forming here, and it's mutating very rapidly. So I think it's kind of interesting to try and figure out what those components are going to be. And I'm, I, I'm other than generically, I'm yeah. not, I'm not in there, hands right. on trying to build stuff. I'm mostly just seeing other people doing it. Um, one thing I want to just give a plug for uh, John Willis. I'm sure yes. most people know. He's got a new book out on Deming. It just came out. He's been. I was talking to him last week at a, at a conference. He's building an. In, he's so hands on. He's been in playing with this stuff super deeply. He's building a, a generative AI thing around the book, so you can go and have conversation. What would Deming think about this? So he's trying to train an AI to be Deming. I think. I'm, wow. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but um, worth just. It's a great book. I've just started reading it. Worth looking at. And um, if you kind of dig around in that and follow what he's doing, he's trying to do something really innovative around. It's not just releasing a book. He's releasing a model that understands the things that the book that, that has all of the teachings of Deming in it in some sense. I, I, know, I think that's what he's trying to do. But I, I just 
it's he's in the middle of getting it done and getting it out i think it would be interesting to just track that maybe you should just have him on the podcast yeah, to try to yeah. explain what he's doing yeah maybe he could join us it'll be a fun conversation yeah. with uh, with john well well adrian thank you uh for your time and i look forward to having more conversations with you maybe we can get some other guests like john on the show some of these younger startups out there who are you know solving some of these uh these problems yeah john is deeply hands-on on all this stuff and i was just desperately trying to keep up in the conversations so um i think that's a huge amount of interesting stuff happening here and it's really going to affect the way we write code the way we deploy systems the kind of stacks we put together so i imagine a lot of change in the next the next year or so great all right adrian thank you very much thank you if you like this video please give us a thumbs up and if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.